Alright, continuing with this series of videos, uh, uh, watching Professor Lowen at MIT uh, teaching the subject of physics. And uh, I shall provide um, <laughs> what um, counter argument, um, maybe it's not the way he's saying it is, or something like that kind of commentary, where appropriate. And such. So this should get interesting double slit experiment. So this might take three parts. We'll see how it goes. Controversy between Newton and Huygens about the nature of light was settled in 1801 when Young was settled. So again, <laughs> so in other videos, he's, he talks as if, oh, it's okay to think about it as a particle, it's okay to think about it as a wave. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's this duality thing is a real thing. And then he says, no, 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 there's no duality. It's a wave. So, you know, it's just, uh, I mean, they can't even get their rhetoric consistent. Um, demonstrated convincingly that light shows all the characteristic of waves. Now, in the early 20th century, the particle character of light surfaced again. So he said all the characteristics of waves. It's only a match in one experiment. <laughs> so this is not exactly all the characteristics. Eh, that should have worked. Let's see if this will work. No, that didn't work. You can use the... And this... Um, and that worked. Mysterious and very fascinating duality of being waves and particles at the same time is now beautifully merged in quantum mechanics. So he calls it merged. He says, uh, nail in the coffin, uh, Young's experiment ended the controversy. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. But today I will focus on the wave character only. Very characteristic for waves are interference patterns, which are produced by two sources, which simultaneously produce traveling waves at exactly the same frequency. Let this be source number one, and let this be source number two. And they each produce waves with the same frequency, therefore the same wavelengths. Right, so this theory won't fit with the single slit at all, because there won't be any source for the interference. Um, and I'd also say what can be understood is this is, again, sort of a resonance argument about this destructive idea is because two forces, you know, are opposite and they effectively cancel each other's energy. And there's none of that realistically with a photon. And they go out, let's say, in all directions. They could be spherical, in the case of water surface, going out like rings. And suppose you were here at position P in space at a distance r1 from source number one, and at a distance r2 from source number two. Then it is possible that at the point P, the two waves that arrive are in phase with each other. That means the mountain from two arrives at the same time as the mountain from one, and the valley from two arrives at the same time as the valley from one. So the mountains become high. Um, and right, that, but that possibility can only be because you're, you've got the two waves exactly a wavelength out of phase. So it has to be a, a whole wavelength out of phase in terms of time. Yeah, and the valleys become lower. We call that constructive interference. It is also possible that... So in water, that doesn't happen. The, there's no valley getting lower and peak getting higher thing. There's peaks that go up and down, and there's things that don't do anything. <laughs> the waves, as they arrive at point P, are exactly 180 degrees out of phase. So that means that the mountain from 2 arrives at the same time as the valley from 1, in which case they can kill each other. And that we call destructive interference. And again, if there's nothing, uh, there's no evidence that the photons are destructively interfering in the sense they don't cancel each other the photon goes to a different location in the end, so there's not that many parallels here. You can have this with water waves, so it's on a two-dimensional surface. You can also have it with 
sound, which would be three-dimensional, so the waves go out on a sphere, and you can have it with electromagnetic radiation, as we will also see today, which is, of course, also three dimensions. And again, it's it's um, there's a, a coincidental uh, fact, okay, that the the, the that you can uh, because of the diffraction that takes place, the change in the angle when you put light through a small aperture, that you can spread the light at certain specific frequency uh, distances. And the distances are related to the frequency of the light. So that relationship exists, but the, the, the effect and the cause have no connection. There's no cause to wave interference isn't the cause of that effect. If particles oscillate, then their energy is proportional to the square of their amplitudes. All right, so this oscillating thing again. <clears throat> so let me just say this is, again, this is part of their, their physics, where they just say something has this energy to do this, where I would argue that nothing has the energy to do this. Something has to act on it, Newton law, okay? Uh, you know, it can't go this way and then stop for no reason, and go this way, and then stop for no reason, and go this way and stop for no reason. There always has to be some actor if you're going to change something's momentum. There has to be an acting force, and they don't count for any of that. So therefore, since energy must be conserved, the amplitude of sound oscillations and also of the electric vector, in the case of electromagnetic radiation, the amplitude must fall off as one over the distance, one over r, because you're talking about 3D waves, you're talking about spherical waves, and the surface area of a sphere grows with r squared. So the amplitude must fall off as 1 over r. 1 over r squared. <laughs> now, if we look at the superposition... I, I don't know why he says 1 over r. Is it's not a 1 over r effect. Light falls off at 1 over r squared. It's this four times thing. Light's doing this four times thing, okay? I mean, uh, I move half the distance four times bigger. It's r squared. Of two waves, in this case at point P, and we make the distance large so that r1 and r2 are much, much larger than the separation between these two points, then this fact that the amplitude of the wave from 2 is slightly smaller than the amplitude from the wave from 1 can then be pretty much ignored. All right, so now he's, he's, he's pretending as if photons have amplitude, um, which is just nonsense. The photon either hits or it doesn't hit. It doesn't have any amplitude. You either get hit by rays of sunlight or they miss you, but there's no amplitude issue. Imagine that the path from here to here is one half of a wavelength longer than the path from here to here. That means that this wave from here to here will have traveled half a period of an oscillation longer than this one. And that means they are exactly 180 degrees out of phase, and so the two can kill each other. Right, and is that realistic? We are just realistically saying to people, do they realistically think that's what photons do? They really think photons just crash into each other and disappear because that's what the force has to do that's what energy conservation requires it to happen and that's not what physically happens the light isn't destroyed by going through the slits the light is changed in the location where it lands so point P changes <laughs> you know but there's no um, there's no destruction of the photon and we call that destructive interference. And so we're going to have destructive interference when R2 minus R1 is, for instance, plus or minus 1 half lambda, but it could also be plus or minus 3 half lambda, 5 half lambda, and so on. And, so and it doesn't have to be a half, because obviously, if you thought of it rationally, you could say they're um, meeting at some other not complete wavelength. So at like one half, you could say one quarter, you could say one fifth, you could say one eighth, 
and then you'd have somehow you have to have a seven eighths of a photon that still lands there or, or three tenths of a photon that lands somewhere so there's no it's obviously you can't break photons into pieces so you know again this math is meaningless for individual photons so in general you would have destructive interference if the difference between r2 and r1 is 2n plus 1 times lambda divided by 2 whereby n is an integer could be 0 or plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 2 and so on right and they change the n so if it's a two-slit experiment there is a zero if there's uh, zero is possible if it's a single slit there's no zero it's just one two three so they change the numbers to suit the experiment the variables change <laughs> which is not a good thing in formulas that's when you would have destructive interference we would have constructive interference if r2 minus r1 is simply n times lambda so then the waves at point p are in phase and n is again could be zero plus or minus one plus or minus two and so on if the sum of the distance to two points is a constant you get an ellipse in mathematics if the difference is a constant which is the case here, the difference to two points is a constant value, for instance, one half lambda, then the curve is a hyperbola. It would be a hyperbola if we deal with a two-dimensional surface, but if we think of this as three-dimensional, so you can rotate the whole thing about this axis, then you get hyperboloids, you get bowl-shaped surfaces. Yeah, I think you can understand, too, that photons aren't doing that. They're not curving their way to their destinations. And so if I'm now trying to tighten the nuts a little bit, suppose I have here two of these sources that produce waves. All right, so this is a critique I have just as the way of the engineer, this learning method has been engineered. And so instead of starting with the single slit, the one that's got the most paradoxical elements to it, they start with the double slit because that's the easy one. And then they'll throw the single slit in later after they got everybody way confused. <laughs> so it won't matter anymore. And the separation between them is D. Then. So <clears throat> when they'll do the single slit, D, okay, will be the width of the slit. So another variable change. So they have to contrive the math to work, they have to change what the variables are representing to get the math to work. It is obvious that the line right through the middle of them and perpendicular to them is always a maximum if the two sources are oscillating in phase. So this line, immediately clear that R2 minus R1 is zero here, if the two are in phase. And they always have to generate the same frequency, of course. So this line would be always a maximum constructive interference this zero so let's understand if you made that line really long did they make it fair to the experiment then the distance between those two dots disappears and so frankly that line ends up just being the light that goes right through the middle of the slits so the stuff that ends up on that straight line most of that light won't have anything to do with anything diffracting it's going to be the light that goes right through the middle of the slit and doesn't diffract at all substitute there. And in case that we're talking about three-dimensional, this is of course a plane going perpendicular to the blackboard right through the middle. I mean realistically the two slits are, are, are small, smaller than the dot at the end of that line. So you can understand that from the from, from being realistic the distance. So you can sort of understand that the, that's when they measure what the intensity of the light is there, they're not going to be able to measure the fact that there's a little slit between the two dots. The difference R2 minus R1 equals lambda would again give me constructive interference. That would be a hyperbola then. R2 minus R1 equals lambda. That would again be a maximum. And you can draw the same line on this side. 
And then R2 minus R1 being two lambda again would be a maximum. So again, they're keeping the, the wave metaphor um, and nobody really worries about the, the, the picture of doing the line segment by segment through distance and that's where you get the hyperbola from because the location of the um, where the two wavelengths, the two distances are equal creates that line. But nothing really travels that line. And again, if this is three-dimensional, you can rotate it about this line, and you get balls. And so in between, you're obviously going to get the minima, the destructive interference, lambda divided by two, and then here, you would have R2 minus R1, three-half lambda. We call these lines where you kill each other, destructive interference, we call them nodal lines, or in case you have a surface, it's a nodal surface. And the maxima are sometimes also called anti-nodes, but I may also refer to them simply as maxima. Yeah, they're called maxima and minima. Nobody calls them nodes. And so this is what we call an interference pattern. If you look right here, between, on the line between the two points, uh, let's, let's understand the two points. He's drawing lines where there are no photons coming through anything. So he's not drawing these lines even where the two dots of light are coming through. So it, kind of a pretty poor <laughs> illustration in that sense. Then you should be able to convince yourself that the linear separation here between two lines of maxima is one half lambda. Figure it out at home. It's very easy. Also, the distance between these two yellow lines, here, right in between, is one half lambda. And so that tells you, then, that the number of lines or surfaces which are maxima is very roughly 2D divided by one half. So, so again, he's got light coming out of where there's a, a, a block. There's nothing can come out of there. So I'm just saying the illustration is perverse to the real dimensions of the experiment. Now, obviously, you can't draw it to its real dimensions, um, well, theoretically, he probably could with his 50 feet of blackboard, but anyway, regardless. Half lambda. So this is the number of maxima, which is also the same roughly as the number of minima, is then approximately 2D divided by lambda. And so if you want more maxima, if you want more of these surfaces, you have a choice. You can make D larger, or you can make the wavelength shorter. And if you make the wavelength shorter, you can do that by increasing the frequency, if you had that control. So, um, how much that actually uh, is true of waves? And again, it would be waves through uh, two slits. Um, you know, the 2D divided by the wavelength. Um, I haven't seen that, so I can't say. Because again, the slit width matters for waves. The first thing that I'm going to do... The distance between the slits isn't as important as the width of the slits. ...is to make you see these nodal lines with a demonstration of water. We have here two sources that we can tap on the water, and the distance between those two tappers, D, it's 10 centimeters, and <clears throat> we're talking about water here. Right, so let's understand that D variable, when they do a single slit, is the width of the slit. Huge difference. Uh, we will tap with a frequency of about 7 hertz, and what you're going to see are very clear nodal lines, it's a two-dimensional surface, where the water doesn't move at all. The mountains and the valleys arrive at the same time. The water is never moving at all. So let me make sure that you can see that well. And so I have to change my... Pretty understandable, I mean, with water waves, right? No, I mean, there's pressure. And so you, you, you have something where the high pressure meets the low pressure. The pressures cancel out and you get flat water. Again, no analogy to photons. My lights. I'll first turn it on. That may be the easiest. Start stepping already. 
I can see the nodal lines very well. So here you see the two tappers. And here you see a line whereby the water is not moving at all. At all moments in time, it's standing still. Here is one. Here is one. And you, even with a little bit of imagination, can see that they are really not straight lines, but they are hyperbolic. If you're very close to one tapper, the zero can... Well, they're not very good hyperbolas. And, um, and clearly the, the distances here are incredibly unlike photons. The tapping distance is huge. The distance you're seeing of the experiment is tiny. Uh, it's no bigger than the distance of the... It's like doing the double slit with light in a, you know, inside of a, the head of a needle or something. It, it doesn't reflect um, what light must be doing, which is extending that pattern in preposterously long dimensions. And that will be exactly zero, because the amplitude of the wave from this one then will always be larger than the amplitude from that one. Because as you go away from the source, the amplitude must fall off on a two-dimensional surface. Right, so he's just pointing out how in water waves in the real world, there's a real effect of traveling distance and, first off. And um, so when you have to travel more distance, you're weaker. And so there's a disproportion when the two waves destructively interfere. They don't destructively interfere completely and you're left with some movement in the water there. And clearly that doesn't happen in light. As one over the square root of r. In a three-dimensional wave, it must fall off as one over r. But if you're far enough away, then the distance is approximately the same, and so the amplitudes of the individual waves are very closely the same, and you can then, like you see here, the water is absolutely standing still. And here are then the areas whereby you see traveling waves, they are traveling waves, they're not standing waves, that here you see, if you were sitting here in space, the water would be up and down, bobbing up and down. And the amplitude that you would have is twice the amplitude that you get from one. Because the mountains add to the mountains and the valleys add to the valleys. And if you were here in space, you would be sitting still. You would not be bobbing up and down at all. <clears throat> right. So, and let's understand, that's a big difference from what we see in the photon experiment, where we see clearly places that are clearly on and places that are clearly off. And there is no bobbing anywhere. No places bobbing. On, off, on, off, on, off. And that is very characteristic for waves. If I were to tap them 180 degrees out of phase, which I didn't, they were in phase, then all nodal lines would become maxima, and all maximum lines would become nodes. That goes without saying, of course. It is essential that you, that the frequencies are the same. So let's understand why that, that has a huge implication and that quite obviously it's very hard to shoot two photons with the same exact frequency, uh, same phase in their, in their process. And, um, and so then when they do the experiment with just um, a single photon at a time, they get the same effect as if there was more photons interfering with each other. So again, this experiment goes down to this idea that somehow a single photon goes through both slits, creates two waves, and somehow does the wave math and figures out where it's supposed to go. And that's ex just accepted as if you can't find a better answer than that. So you were all to believe, okay, that there can't be any better answer than that. That's the best we can do, is some idea that a photon that seems to be the tiniest, smallest thing we really know of until they invented new particles. Um, <laughs> but, you know, a thing going the speed of light, very small, very discreet, has a tiny, tiny profile in the world when it lands. Um, that somehow that thing comes to two slits that are many, 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 many times bigger than the photon could possibly be. Somehow it travels through both of them. It does that by some magical power becomes a round wave instead of a photon, you know, that represents itself in some wave manner, has its waves do its interacting for it, and then lands as a little tiny thing uh, where the waves decide is the right place to be. And everybody just accepts that that's the best we can do. Uh, sorry, that's too silly an answer. <laughs> absolute must. 
They don't have to be in phase, the two tappers. If they're not in phase, then the positions in space where you have maxima and minima will change. But a must is that the frequency is the same. Now, I was hiking last year. So that's an interesting fact in the sense that if you, um, if you thought two photons could have something to do with the experiment, like they're going through and they're interacting with each other, that sort of defeats it because then the on-off patterns would be shifting all over the place. So they, you know, you, they wouldn't have any symmetry. So clearly this can't be about one photon interacting with another photon ever. It always has to be about each individual photon doing its own wave math. So even though they're, each photon going through is doing the same wave math, somehow they don't even mix their waves. So all these photons are turning into billions of photons. They're turning into waves and all of their individual waves somehow aren't getting confused with each other at all so they can create a very symmetrical pattern. Because if they did get confused there would be an imbalance. In Utah, when I noticed a butterfly in the water of a pond which was fighting for its life. And you see that butterfly here. Tom, perhaps you can turn off that uh, overhead. You see the butterfly here and you see here projected on the bottom the beautiful rings dark and bright because these rings on the water act like lenses and what you see very dramatically is indeed what I see. Yeah, what you see very dramatically is there's no interference <laughs> okay you see very dramatically that there is just a nice symmetrical ring pattern with one disturbance the single slit and yet the single slit in light doesn't create that pattern it creates a bunch of broken bars. Said that the amplitude of the wave must go down with distance, because energy must be conserved, of course, in the wave. And since the circumference. So again, another irrelevancy with photons. We know they don't do any of this diminishing stuff except in their number. So unlike water, they're not full of tension and full of friction with the bottom of the water and you know all that stuff. So they're not being degraded at anywhere near the rate that the force, the, the pressure in the water is degraded. Rose, linearly with R, the amplitude must go down as 1 over the square root of R because the energy in the wave is proportional to the amplitude squared. So when I saw this, it occurred to me that it would be a good idea to catch another butterfly, put it next to it, and then photograph, make a fantastic photograph of an interference pattern. But I realized, of course, immediately, having taken 802, that the frequencies of the two butterflies would Yes, inconsistent frequencies, and therefore you wouldn't get a, you'd get a pattern, but it wouldn't, yeah, I don't know what it would look like. It would have to be exactly the same, and so I gave up the idea, and I decided not to be cruel. So no other butterfly was sacrificed. If we look at the directions where we expect the maxima as seen from the location of the sources then I want to remind you of what a hyperbola looks like uh, here are these two again. sources and here is the center uh, sorry just trying to see if I can get this keyboard to work like, yeah, it's you can draw a line here then a hyperbola would look like this let me re remove the part on the left. doesn't look too good. But it's the same on the left, of course. And what you remember from your high school math, that it approaches that line. And therefore, you can define angle theta as seen from the center between these two, which are the directions where you have maxima and where you have minima. And that's what I'm going to work out for you now on this blackboard here. Just pointing out that the hyperbola becomes kind of irrelevant the longer you go in distance the less you're going to notice the hyperbole. So here are now the two sources that oscillate. There's one here, and there's one here, and here is the center in between them. And let this separation be D. And I am looking very far away so it's, it's, again, it's kind of deceptive because the, the D is usually the width of the impediment. 
and he, the way he's drawing it, you could almost say it's going from the center of one slit to the center of another slit because he's using these point sources of vibration. So, you know, he should just get to the two slit instead of, you know, I think this makes it a little deceptive. Damn, that should have worked. I thought that should have worked because I thought I hit the keyboard, but I wanted to use the mouse again. It's just tricky. I, I hate to use the K. K will work, right? I'm approaching this but line where the I I can't, I can't reach the mirror, K. so to speak, is a straight line. And so I look very far away without being committing myself how far. Yeah. I'm looking in the direction theta away. So this is theta. And so this is theta. And I want to know in which directions of theta I expect to see maxima and in which direction I expect to see minima. So this is what we call earlier R1 and we call this earlier R2. It is the distance to that point very far away. If I want to know what R2 minus R1 is, that's very easy now. I draw a line from here perpendicular. <coughs> so this is the classic geometry that goes with their theory. So they really are just measuring how much distance is a wavelength through this kind of silly manner where they know it mathematically. They could just do it mathematically. They don't need this geometry to do it. They're just establishing how much distance is a wavelength. I was hoping that would work. To this line, and you see immediately that this distance here is R2 minus R1. But that distance is also, you realize that this angle is theta, it's the same one as that one, so that distance here is also d sine theta. And so now I'm in business, I can predict in what directions we will see constructive interference. Because all we are demanding now, requesting that r2 minus r1 is n times lambda. And so we need that d sine theta and I'll give it a suck. <laughs> so that, that part even didn't make any sense. He says R2 minus R1 equals D. And then he leaves the equal sign and then he, for no reason adds D sine theta. So, you know, since, since, <laughs> so, whoops. it was equaling D. How can it equal D plus something else or minus something else? Index N, as in Nancy, equals n times lambda. In other words, that the sine of theta n is simply n lambda divided by d. And that uniquely defines all those directions, the whole zoo of directions, n equals zero, that is the center line, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, and so on. Right. So and then I have the this is where I point out that this pattern isn't that complicated. It's like the simplest pattern you can create in the universe, on, off, on, off. And it's basically just saying that if your if your wavelength of light and your distance are going to dictate what that angle is going to be, and that's it. So the distance of the impediment in the double slit plus <coughs> the a multiple of the wavelength times your integer. If you just take that, you'll get an angle. So it'd be like three degrees or whatever. And you know every three degrees is an on and every one and a half degrees is an off. And you just go forever, theoretically, with that sequence. So it's the simplest pattern in the universe, and yet they're trying to make it into something unique. Like this, you, you could say, well, only this pattern can only be created by wave interference. When if you analyze it, it's an incredibly simple pattern. It's like me putting a rock or in, on a tire. <laughs> you know, it creates an on-off pattern when you have a consistent uh, uh, velocity. I put three rocks on, you know, consistent pattern. There's no need for a wave interference. It's just a pattern. A whole family of destructive interference, which would require that V sine theta must now be 2n plus 1 times lambda divided by 2, just as we had it on the blackboard there. We discussed that earlier. And so that requires then that the sign of theta n for the destructive... These are just simple things that you don't really realize when you don't know all this math stuff. But as soon as you put something, theta uh, over a 2, or a lambda over a 2, 
you have just really said I'm multiplying it times a half. So it's just saying one half uh, lambda. So instead of just saying one half lambda, they're doing this lambda over two, but it's just saying one half of a lambda. I mean, they ought to have a, a notation that gets rid of the de unnecessary denominator in a sense by just, uh, you know, a little signet. You know, they have little hats. They have different things. They do the things for when they're just having something. If interference is going to be 2n plus 1 times lambda divided by 2d. So this indicates the directions where we expect maxima and where we expect minima as seen from the center between the two sources. But now I would like to know what the linear distance is if I project this onto a screen which is very far away. So this is the only math they have is for these very specific things. So they can tell you, they can tell you the angle and then they can tell you an amplitude at that spot, you know, how much light there will be because they have to account for the fact that that doesn't really destructively interfere. And then they can tell you uh, how far on a screen, a certain distance away, how big that three degree angle would be. So if it's a three degree angle, they're basically just doing the simple math of just saying, well, three degrees at 10 feet will give you seven inches and three degrees at five feet will give you five inches. And you know, they're just doing very simple calculations that don't require any wave theory. And so let us have a screen at a distance, capital L, which has to be very far away. So here are now the two sources, different scale. And here is a screen. And the distance from the two sources to the screen is capital L. And here is one of those directions, theta. Then you see a meet. One of those simple angles, and it's always the same angle. So it's three degrees, six degrees. It's always multiple. The end number now is just a multiple. So you're just saying three degrees, six degrees, nine degrees, 12 degrees. Immediately, that if I call this the direction x, x being zero here, that the tangent of theta is x divided by L. If, but only if I deal with small angles, the tangents of theta is the same as the sine of theta. And therefore, I can now tell you where the maxima will lie on that screen. I don't know why I got quieter. Line, which I call zero. That is now when x of n is L times the sine of theta in small angle approximation. So this is approximately L times n lambda divided by d. And for the same reason, you will get here destructive interference when x of n is going to be L times 2n plus 1 times lambda divided by 2d. That is simple geometry. <clears throat> right. So it's and kind of useless information, really, frankly. So it has no theoretical meaning. Um, just converting an angle through distance, saying, okay, it's, it's a millimeter here, it's five centimeters here, ten centimeters there. It's not very... Um, so now we have all the ingredients here on the backboard, and I'm going to leave it there for the rest of the lecture. Whenever we're going to do an experiment with two sources, which are in phase at the same frequency, you can predict the directions of maxima and minima, and you can even predict the separation, the linear separation, if you know how far away you are from these sources. And the first demonstration that I'm going to do is with sound. We have here two loudspeakers. So again, it won't work when he does this demonstration with light in a single slit without completely reworking that mathematics. So just understand, it's not consistent. And the distance between those two loudspeakers, that we're going to do it with sound, D is 1.5 meters, that's a given. And the frequency is 3,000 hertz. The wavelengths, therefore, lambda equals V divided by the frequency. The speed of sound is about 340 meters per second. So all of this is just saying, okay, look, there's a common function, a similar function, that when you have two waves in a fluid, that there's a certain geometry to how they mix. 
speed and you know over distance and there's a certain geometry and that there's this similar kind of geometry affecting light when it goes through a small narrow opening that something happens to the light that in the same proportional way changes this one angle and it's really the angle so all you're really saying is where where is this angle created now in the water wave we can understand the angle is created by the fact that the wave okay the waves are being bulged by the fact that when they hit the slit material there's friction on the sides slows the wave down causes the middle to be going a little faster than the the other side the bottom and it has adhesion so this the molecules stick to each other so they create a a bulge and then that bulge moves through space at, at this consistent um, way and what you're really doing is measuring the angle of that circumference of the circle and the geometry is very circular so that's another reason why you can see a consistency that it's just breaking down to the fact that there's 180 degrees of movement uh, freedom of movement so I mean it's not like these are two so foreign uh, and that this association is so bizarre or unique or amazing there's very few factors variables involved and they're all connected to something that you can understand which is the geometry of a circle divided by 3000 is about 0.113 meters so the wavelength is about 11.3 centimeters I can now calculate Everyone who is sitting here, right in the middle, through this whole plane, will have a maximum of sound. And then when we go away at angle theta, some will again have maxima. And we go further away theta, again maxima. In between will be the minima. So this will be a very unscientific experiment in the sense he's not going to be using any instrumentality to, to show us this difference in the sound and how well the waves are revealing this difference. Because again, sound waves are physically destructively interfering and I'm going to calculate where they fall in the lecture hall the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to give you n as in Nancy and calculate that angle theta of n and I will do it for the maxima in other words sound is a pressure wave so there's high pressure and low pressure so when they interfere with each other it's the low pressure is going to meet this the high pressure part and they're both going to cancel out to a neutral pressure. So you're not going to hear the frequency. I'm going to use constructive interference. And you see that the sine of theta n is n lambda divided by d. That's the equation I use. When n is 0, the angle is 0. That is 0 angle. Everyone here will hear a maximum. When n is 1, and you may want to check that at home, I find... So again, in the single slit, there will be no 0. Okay, the single, the, the middle will be called one, and then twos, twos, and then three, three, you know, two, two threes, and then two fours, um, but there will be no zero. An angle of 4.3 degrees, and when n is two, the angle is about double that, it's about 8.7 degrees, and when n is three, it should be close to 13 degrees, 13.1. In case you take n is 10, so I skip a few, you get about 49 degrees. This is again perfectly consistent with this idea that it's all just an angle change, and you know it's, it's a multiple of a single angle change. So lots of ways to describe that. I would say that if this was an electron for photons and they we're hitting electrons, and each electron caused that much of a change or deflection. You could sort of understand that a photon could hit an electron and deflect four degrees this way, and then it could go four degrees that way, and then go four degrees this way, and then another four degrees this way, another four degrees that way, depending on what it hits. But a maximum fall. And so there's going to be a maximum here, and then 4.3 degrees away is again a maximum. But surely we would like to know how far you in the audience will have to move in order to go from a maximum to a minimum. And so the way you have to think of this is that if I make here a picture of the lecture hall, if here are these two sources. So you know, there are lots of problems with the way he's doing this experiment because, you know, not using real test instruments and all that stuff because, you know, we have two ears and, you know, we're talking about small gaps 
You're not going to be able to detect that with <laughs> two ears. You are at a distance L away from here. Some of you are five meters away. Some are 10 meters away. Some are 15 meters away, all the way in the back of the audience. And you want to know where are you going to hear the maxima? I call this X1. I call this X2. And I call this X3. So the simple way to do this would be just to diagram that, just to say, well, we, how far at the maximum distance, and then just draw your line, and you could just see it. Like, okay, the people 15 feet away are going to get half that distance. So if we know in the furthest away, in the back of the room, you, have to, you can move a whole foot and a half to hear the difference between the, the destructive interference and the constructive interference, the louder and the weaker. Um, then uh, you know you can just draw that line and proportionally and you know just do the geometry instead of wasting extra time on all this math. And this is zero. So this is the meaning of theta one. And this is the meaning of theta three. And this angle here would be theta two. That's the meaning of these angles. And so I can calculate now how far you have to move, depending on what capital L is, to here to go from one maximum in sound to another maximum. Let me raise the, a little more. And so I will show you now some of the, the results for maxima. So I only go now for constructive interference. And I have done this for three different distances. Those of you who are five meters away from me, 10 meters away from me and 15 meters away from me. And what you see on the left side is going to be X. That is the linear separation. And these, so these were in meters. Forgive me, but I will do these in centimeters. And this is X1. If you are five meters away from me, you will have, I will put X1 a little lower. Then I have it now. You will see shortly why I put it a little lower. X1. This is about 38 centimeters. So the linear separation from one to the next is 38 centimeters. And you're 10 meters away, it's double that. That's no surprise, 76 centimeters. And if you're 15 meters away, it is 113 centimeters. So it's only 15 and between two, on and off. Which is the position where you have another maximum, would be at 76 centimeters. And it would be at 152 centimeters. And Just it would be at 228 centimeters if you're 15 meters away from me. Just doubled. So the minima will fall almost exactly in between. And so the minima, where in an ideal case there is no sound at all, sound plus sound gives silence, think about it, sound plus sound will give silence, will be... No. High pressure, low pressure gives no pressure. When you are roughly at 19 centimeters, half of this, this will be 38 centimeters, half of this, and here will be something like 57 centimeters. And you can calculate what these values are. They're exactly in between. So at five meters, and so, the so at five meters, which is it's not insignificant, you know, you've only got this to work with. Not too good. The conclusion is that if you're five meters away from me, and you're near the center line, but you can also be a little bit in this direction, that the separation between bright sound, loud sound, which is always at zero, of course, in the middle, to silence is 19 centimeters. And then you move another 19 centimeters, and then you hear loud sound. If you are, however, 10 meters away from me, just past the cameras, then you have... Another reason why this can't work, it's, you know, is it sound's going to be bouncing off the walls, and, <laughs> you know, it's not going to... It's, hopelessly imprecise experiment. You have to move 38 centimeters to go from loud sound to silence. And if you're all the way in the audience, in the back of the audience, it's more like 60 centimeters. All right. Well, we'll save the big fun of the, the big excitement of the experiment itself for the next time and such. Uh, this really isn't double slit. I mean, he's still wasting time on, uh, <laughs> you know, a subject that just isn't related. I mean, they want to make it related, fine, but it's really not related. All you have is an angle. So all you're saying is, is yes, sound has an angle sep separation for one set of reasons. Water has a set of reasons. 
and light has a set of its reasons, but the reasons aren't the same reason. Alright, so till the next time and such. Mm, yeah, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's recorded properly.